Okay, everybody, how are you all today? Here we are in the middle still of evolutionary action, realistic evolutionary action. I'm so pleased with that. I have to give Alan Wallace the benefit of I first saw that and he, he did that. But then he went back to being conventional Theravada right action. And I love realistic because it means it's not authoritarian, authority-based rule. You know, you're right because you're following the rule, you're right or you're wrong, like the coming from monotheistic culture, like, like the Western one. It's having to do with the nature of reality, what is, ameliorates reality. So realistic is really good, I think, and I'm, I'm kind of stuck on it. Translators, of course, do get stuck, and then they un get unstuck later, because language, after all, is a living process. It's constantly changing, and uh, it's connecting people, and people ascribe meaning to it. It doesn't have intrinsic meaning. It's meaningless intrinsically, but, but relative meaning is, is, is strongly meaningful enough. And that's, that's one of the essential things to understand about Buddha's discoveries. So to begin, we're on page 85 of the text, if you're following with the text. Speech is the form of action <coughs> where the self interconnects with others by sharing experience through language. Being heard is being given the privilege of temporarily occupying another's mind. Listening is opening one's own mind to another. Isn't that nice? When you lie and deceive others, you imprison them in an unreality. You excise them from your reality and lose connection. When you reveal whatever you know of truth to others, you expand your world and invite them into it. And this doesn't mean being, again, intrinsically attached to your version of reality. It means being realistic about whatever you think. And it doesn't mean also, you know, there are always exceptions because rules are relative. And action is always a little bit in individual and unique in every case. And for example, if someone is, if some bad people are chasing somebody to kill them or harm them or persecute them or capture them, and you sense that they're bad and the person who you've seen flee past you is, is uh, clearly the, the, the one who is being violated, then it is, you don't have to say, I saw him go over into that door. You say, well, I didn't see anybody, or you say they went that way, or you, otherwise you can, t you can cling to a different reality, and you are actually lying, but that is a correct one because you're being compassionate. So, you know, compa compassion and mercy and love always uh, make it a little bit exceptional. When you speak divisively to put others into conflict with one another by slandering and backbiting, you endanger them and sever your connection with them both. Even though you may think you get closer to one by getting that one to separate from another, you alienate yourself from the other. When you reconcile them with each other, on the other hand, you share your world wherein your world wherein they can love each other then actually they both can feel your friendship and you expand your world by being accepted into theirs. So, you know, it seems like maybe you get closer to someone by bad-mouthing another one, but then eventually, because you're bad-mouthing anybody, that one sort of subliminally understands that you're, you're a little bit, uh, there's a risk involved with you, you might bad-mouth them in the future to get close to someone else, and so you'll end up losing everybody when you behave like that. And also you're harming them <coughs> by getting them to be against each other. When you abuse the privilege of being heard by speaking harshly, you trash their sensitivity and mentally harm them, destroy their receptivity, distance them from you, and disconnect yourself. I can swear to that, having had a hot temper when I was younger, and still it's, the possibility is there. Uh, it always causes, it always has blowback it when you speak harshly. It's really the worst. And, and loving couples will do that sometimes. They get miffed with each other and they'll blow off steam and they, they think, and then, oh, yes, dear, so I'm so sorry. But it has wounded the relationship for sure. 
when you speak sweetly, melodically, poetically, pleasantly, you draw closer to them. The sweetness comes from your attunement to what causes them pleasure, and your sense of identification with them expands. The great performer, artist, opera singer, rock and roll artist, actor, opens their heart into vulnerability, and what comes out of their mouth reaches straight through the conceptual defenses of their audience and touches their hearts. Mutual identification occurs, elevating both performer and audience into a self-transcending moment. That's the thing that uh, theatrical people, actors and artists, performers, dancers and things, the singers, they get addicted to that positive feedback from the audience. And that's why they love theater or they love performing or whatever it is that they do. There's something really awesome about it, actually. When you babble, babble mindlessly, finally, the fourth one, when you babble mindlessly, disrespecting the privilege of being with the listener, you lead them into disconnection from reality, into chaos and loss. When you speak meaningfully, on the other hand, you share your own revelation from the insights of enlightened beings, those who have become truly realistic because they have become one with their reality. You share your, oh, we are all one with our reality, actually, but we keep putting up these conceptual screens between us and the objects and people around us. And so, but when, you, when you're able to directly experience things and you don't get lost in some separate world in your mind because you're driven and captured by your concepts, actually, even when you do that, you're one with your concepts. So you can then use them to, if you think that an enlightened being, a Buddha, is someone who doesn't think. <laughs> You're wrong. But the thing is, their thinking can create things. They can use their thinking in a better way because they're in charge of them. It's like the ego. The ego is just the pronoun. It's the Greek pronoun. When you're in Greece, you say, ego likes some yogurt, you know, or I go is fine, you know. And so that's just a pronoun. And that's the way you organize your presence and present it to others, you use a pronoun. And everybody uses the same pronoun referring to different persons. And you are a different person at different times and you use the same pronoun. So it's nothing to fear when it's just something that you use. When you think there's an absolute fixed identity inside yourself and you must conform to it and you must do whatever impulse comes out of it, it seems to come out of it and so on, then that's when you're captured by the ego, and that's what selflessness is meant to help you correct. It's a realistic thing, because actually there's nothing inside Bob Thurman that is an absolutely fixed, unchanging thing, except if Bob Thurman is loving, then that love, which is a kind of form of happiness and bliss shared, uh, is, is definite. That's the only thing that's relatively absolute. <laughs> You share your own realism and you help your listener confront their own reality, which actually ultimately makes them happy. Reality is always liberating, energizing, encouraging, though maybe challenging sometimes. And you come together with the listener as you both brace yourselves for evolutionary progress with your sharing of responsibility in freedom of choice. The mind, now that's the speech, that's my elaboration of the speech, and it couldn't be more important for us to be more focused and aware of what we say because it is so powerful in that it immediately spreads with others and even, even knowing the imperfection of speech. And we may mean something a little different by what we say than what someone else hears because they have different sense of connotation about the words. But we can even become conscious of that in specific places and audience and realize how our choice of language is and it has some subjective element in it. And it's, very, it's a little bit imperfect. And we can also give others benefit of the doubt when they use language in a way that actually is not the way we ex are used to it. And so we can do that. But yet to be aware of its importance and power and take care with it is really, really important. Now the mind is the subtlest but most powerful of the three levels since it directs the activities of speech and body. Buddhist scientists, not being dogmatists, consider mind in at least two ways in different contexts, both as different in kind from phenomena of the physical level and also previously only esoterically 
as the most super subtle of the physical levels. The materialist scientists should like this flexibility of ideology, since it validates materialistic reductionisms in some contexts, especially the medical and nowadays the technological. They get, you know, here, there, what I meant by that, I realize, gee whiz, you know, it's so packed sometimes when I write. What I meant by that was, you know, anger in, in medicine is bile. It's connected to bile, heat, and acidity in the system. And the emotion of anger is very much mobilizes the bile element in the body. Delusion emphasizes the phlegm element, the sort of connecting water and earth. Phlegm is a combination of water and earth, like a pasty thing that has a cohesiveness and it can have a good element. So kind of being, uh, you know, it's uh, hanging together. But also it uh, covers over your energy. And then the wind element is your desire, is the same as desire. So instead of saying someone's lusty, you say their, their winds are over-elevated. It's saying they're angry some, their bile is over-elevated. Instead of they're deluded or they're lethargic or something, you say that mentally, you say their, their phlegm element is too much. So that's why it's, it's all right to consider to be reductionist, actually. And then they also are mentalistically reductionist. They say that the material things are your mind. And that also is correct in the sense that we are constructing, for example, in the famous five aggregate system, which I think I already explained in the context of looking for the self, you know, the material elements of the body, the sensation where the mind senses and feels pleasure and pain in different parts of the body, the recognitions where we conceptually recognize something, the mental creations and fabrications where we, we construct things in certain ways in the mind, and finally the pure awareness itself, as, as dualistic vijnana it's called, and jnana and vijnana and prajna are all forms of intelligence and discernment and, and mental awareness. And uh, they have more words for different co kinds of consciousness maybe than we do. Their psychology is so elaborated. So we can say that, uh, that uh, the world is all mind. There's a way of reducing it to the mind. And in the, in the material aggregate, for example, or material process of the body, the visible objects that we see around us, the sounds that we hear around us, the smells and the tastes, and of course touch, you pretty much have to contact it. But those five physical uh, perceptual fields are part of our body, so they are one of our aggregates. So, that, so we look for the self, we can look for the self outside of our skin, <laughs> as if it was an object outside of it. And sometimes people, when they get psych psychotic or they go crazy, they think somebody's commanding them from up above, or they have some weird mystical thing like there's a ka in the sky, the Egyptians, which is yourself, which is connected to you by the silver cord. And they, people will go into weird ideas like that. But the point is, even that kind of a self is not there. But the point is, even in that simplistic uh, sort of map of your being, your material presence is more like a field than like just a being inside a skin, inside an environment that is simply not himself or herself. In other words, what we see around us is sort of, we are the field of everything we see and hear and smell and taste and touch around us. That's really quite interesting, even from the beginning of the basic level. The reductibility, reducibility of either mind to matter or matter to mind is okay. And uh, some, many people think that the whole Buddhist thing is to reduce everything to mind. But that's incorrect, actually. That is a version of Buddhist theory, but, and it's useful in some context. And I think particularly in a context that I've not often seen elaborated in sutras or shastras or things in the Buddhist literature, but in the context where you're entertaining the idea that a high being like a Buddha is sort of distributed everywhere in the universe. And actually, when to become a Buddha, you have to change the whole world around you. You have to bring all beings with you. And exactly what that means, it seems overwhelming when you think of material world as, as res extensa, 
something just spread out everywhere. How can you change the whole thing? <laughs> the trees and the people and the concrete and the cities and the planets and the continents. It seems like totally impossible. But if you sort of say, well, it all is somehow interactive with mind, and it is a mind field of me and other beings, which of course includes gods, demons, as well as angels, um, and, and um, underworld beings and so forth, as well as just human beings, animals. So when you say the world is a collective mind field of beings, and it's how their minds kind of interact through, in a way, creating material things in between themselves and extending their minds with bodies and so on, where they can touch each other and, and hold each other and, 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 uh, and perceive each other as outside themselves. Then, uh, <clears throat> when you reduce that to, when you're on the edge of reduc reductionism, to, uh, mental reductionism there and saying it's all mind, as many uh, spiritual mystics and people will say, because you can have an experience like that, then, uh, uh, then you can say, well, I'll change all of it. You can make the Bodhisattva vow, I'll bring them all with me. And it seems easier because mind is more malleable, it's more fluid, it's more, change, more obviously changeable than rocks and trees and mountains and things. But actually, it's, that's not the highest view, because the higher view is more pragmatic and more realistic, where maybe it is a collective mind field in some sense, because there are so many different beings, but on the other hand, it is convenient to relate to each other, to have Im immaterial obje material objects in between ourselves. And actually, uh, and actually, when we totally change, that changes the whole thing, creates a nexus of a being that is beyond, is sort of beyond this being located in a particular place. An unlocated awareness, non-local awareness, as people might say in physics, where a Buddha is everywhere. And that creates a situation where Buddha, you think of Buddha as other than you in a relational sense, but as a being who feels that the same as you in, in their own, from their own perspective, which is actually simultaneously your perspective, so then you can feel the presence of the enlightened beings around you at all times. And this is very comforting and very pleasant and very excellent since Buddhas are beings that only wish your welfare. So it, ha it relates to the, the way of perceiving reality as if it was good and something supportive and not something you're afraid of. And even, therefore, not being afraid of death yourself, not being afraid of any kind of transition, willing to, feeling kind of the well-being around you rather than sort of the paranoia, where's the tick, where's the danger? And you can still look for something that will make you uncomfortable and unpleasant, and it might be unpleasant for another being, and yet feel still basically both are good. Within that, there's preferable and non-preferable relationships, right? You still can do that. So that's quite, so the subtlest is where you recognize mind and matter are a binary pair and uh, the, the world works well when you can deal with them from, in a flexible way. You can reduce one to another or one to another in either direction at different times and you can leave them intactly di you know, uh, uh, dissonant and binary and you are so much more flexible in dealing with things. It's, cause it's quite wonderful. The materialist scientist should like this flexibility of ideology, since the flexibility of ideas or perspectives, you could say, since it is non-dogmatic and open-minded, since it validates materialistic reductionism in some contexts, especially the medical and nowadays the technological. They get more worried about the opposite context, where mentalistic or spiritualistic reductionism is also validated, and immensely useful, as in developing psychological well-being and unleashing the subtle supernormal powers of the mind. I never say supernatural, like telekinesis or clairvoyance or telepathy and so on. Those are all normal, and everybody has those abilities. Again, this extraordinary supercomputer we have is a brain throughout our body. We are like the octopi of our nervous, our, our octopus of a subtle nervous system you know, it is extraordinary. And oh, there's, these, are or, no, these are ordinary. But, uh, but the, we don't, we, 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 we ha our culture dictates 
a way of sort of not reading other person's mind, or have feeling our own mind can't be telepathized or cannot be clairvoyantly read off by someone else. And so that's the way our culture is. So to, it's super normal for us to have these abilities. Uh, but we naturally do have them, actually. And some people naturally more than others. And some people can cultivate where they totally have them. And, and actually, they say it's uh, to, to seek to develop them for their own sake is dangerous and distracting from seeking the, fi the final and high level of really understanding everything and opening one's mind and heart in such a way as to be compassionate and wise in, in dealing with the world and hence utterly beneficial. That's, it. That's the most important. And these things will come along the way as you develop your abilities and develop your insights. But once you are there and you become a teacher, of a, not just like an academic teacher, like someone like me, who just you know, reads the things and transmits them and understands them on some plane, oh, but a little more than just purely intellectually, but not necessarily enlightened, but someone who's fully that way and who really takes the burden of the responsibility of directing someone else spiritually, they need to be clairvoyant, actually. And they need to be a telepathic and te telekinetic, ideally. Uh, and, and there are degrees within that. So it doesn't mean everyone needs to be a complete and perfect Buddha. Bodhisattva can also teach. <coughs> but ideally, everyone will be. That's the idea. So you should you automatically get all these so-called powers when you get more connected to everything. So... So they get more work. scientists, Western scientists, modern scientists who are materialistic at, due to wanting to get away from religious dogmatism. They got very materialistic, and then they get material. Now they have gotten materialistically dogmatic, and they are imprisoning themselves that way. But they get more worried, therefore, about the opposite context, where mentalistic or spiritualistic reductionism is also validated and immensely useful, as in developing psychological well-being and unleashing the subtle supernormal powers of the mind, such as clairvoyance, clairaudience, enhanced memory, precognition, precognition of the future, telepathy, and telekinesis. It is very important for spiritual philosophers, scientists, to recognize the mind as equally approachable as the super-subtle physical, not only in the practical sense that it affects things around you through the instruments of speech and body, but also on the super-subtle energy plane where through morphic resonance, it acts directly on the super subtle level of other mind. And here we're talking about the wonderful concept the biologist, the biological scientist, originally a materialist named Rupert Sheldrake, developed in Oxford over many years, where he noticed that beings communicate kind of brain to brain. And he observed this in micro beings, in, in microscopes, he, bacteria and things. He observed it in animals like flights of geese, or monkeys on an island, different things. He observed it in humans through fashion uh, and fads and using television sort of commercials in a certain area and then set testing to see if people liked certain objects and sort of mass, mass tastes shifted. And he called it morphogenetic resonance or morphic resonance. And I have adapted that theory into history where I see, where I teach, like the time of Buddha was the axial age, where a, a large number of beings in the very populous culture, that of ancient India, which was massively populous, just as it is today, the most popular, more than China now, most populous country or, or zone or subcontinent in the world. It's not really a single nation, except in, in some particular sense, it's many different nations knitted together in a federation. And uh, there, there many people attained these sort of supernormal understandings and ideas and enlightening ideas and became yogis and so on. And at that same time, you had Confucius and Lao Tzu in China and many other colleagues of theirs with social changes that are still influencing China society even today, even under the communist a total like materialist attack that they did with Marxism and transformation they, that happened at some level within their culture, but deeper down the Confucian, the one 2,500 years ago, is still very operative. In India, the Buddha and the, the other Buddhas, the, who are called the Sutrakaras, 
but they are still trying to catch up with that, even 2,500 years later. Socrates, Plato, and the pre-Socratics in the Mediterranean, uh, Zoroaster in Persia, uh, and who knows what was going on among the Toltecs and the Olmecs in the New World, and the Incas and the Mayans, and so we don't really know what was going on. It was just since things seemed to have been separated at that time, but definitely things were going on. Even mound builders up in the north, there were obviously huge human developments. So the morphic resonance, the subtle mental transformation, was definitely radiating around the planet by morphic resonance. Similarly, the Renaissance at that time, around 1400, 1500, Similarly, uh, other eras like that were the, the time of Christ and the time of the Mahayana in India and uh, religious Taoism in, and religious Confucianism in China and, and so forth, you know. Uh, and there are these waves, then the Islamic wave, 600, it seems to be 500 year waves over that you can discern in history. And uh, I would adapt a morphic resonance sheltering thing to that, but anyway. So it acts directly on the super subtle level of other minds. Now we have a heading going deeper into common sense. I love this one. The three mental evolutionary actions in themselves are parallel to the three physical ones. Killing, saving, you know, not killing in other words, and saving lives. Stealing, given with property. And sexual harm and sexual help. Hateful, malicious mind thinks destructive thoughts and imagines killing and destroying, and so cuts you off from the larger identification with the living. Loving, benevolent mind imagines union with others, identifies with their lives and wishes their happiness, and expands your own life and evolution. Covetous, greedy mind wants to take away others' things or even their identities, just like the physical act of stealing, and cuts you off from enjoying their possessions through their doing so. Like, like we do enjoy our child when it gets a present and it's so happy, he or she. And, and, uh, and so their enjoyment is our enjoyment in that sense. We all identify like that. And from mentally rejoicing about others' wealth and beauty, which is the supreme antidote for envy, what's called congratulatory rejoicing as a cultivated thing, counting others' blessings in a way and enjoying them, and thereby getting like a little vicarious pleasure from them. Generous and freely detached mind enacts a giving action in thought, wanting others to have more and better things, likes them enjoying their things, and wants to give them more, and so expands your sense of abundance. And this is the happiness of like Swedish socialism, you know, uh, Scandinavian socialism, Norwegian, uh, I should say, Finnish, Danish, Swedish socialism. And... Uh, uh, and, and, and actually in the European Union, generally French and other socialism. And it's the silliness of our version where we think socialism is some terrible thing. But in a way, we are, capitalists are right. Socialism involves capitalism, but it's capitalism for the, for the many as well as for the one. It doesn't exclude the one, but it doesn't get them completely out of touch with everybody else, like the sort of laissez-faire capitalism. And so therefore, we make socialism into a bad thing which makes it why we're unhappy, why our rich people are all never satisfied and always more unhappy. Because when you're depriving others of things, it actually, you feel by morphic resonance their unhappiness and dissatisfaction. You can go put yourself in a golden room like King Midas and you still feel the vibe of their minds because you are being, who your mental attitude determines how you experience things. And so it even though you're supposedly appreciating some expensive thing, when everybody else outside is starving to death, you get a bad vibe and you don't feel happy. So then you might want to accumulate. You might wrongly misunderstand why you don't feel well and instead fill your room up with food, which is too much for you to eat. It all rots around you and that makes you even more unhappy and then you want to fill the universe with it, that you want to own the universe. So it's like totally... The sources of our happiness have a lot to do with the vibes around us as well as what we possess or what we, or what we experience. So, but but that, those subtle morphic resonance levels of experience, though, we have a materialistic uh, tendency to ignore and, or to believe they're not there. Uh, but uh, hip, hip society knows about it. Oh, the vibes are so great here, you know. 
oh, the vibes are terrible. I was feeling good till I came here. You know, in other words, there's an awareness like that. So, covered as we did that, generous and freely detached mind in action, giving action in thought, wanting others to have more and better things, likes them enjoying their things, and wants to give them more, and so expands your sense of abundance. Unrealistic mind, you know, get a billionaire to go to a soup kitchen and dish out some rice and dal, like the wonderful Sikh, Sikh people in India do. They have these free food in all of their gurdwaras, or their churches, you could say, or their temples. And any poor person can go and have a good meal there without feeling bad in any way. And then the people love giving it, and they feel happy seeing they're satisfied and so on. Unrealistic mind, and this is a stretch, but I think it works. Unrealistic mind, that's the mental one, that is a mind that has some fanatic idea that's very close-minded and only this is the way and I only have my narrow perspective and I'm the right perspective and everybody else is wrong and so on. Unrealistic mind disconnects itself and encloses you in the narrow world of self-centeredness. You think you are great, others are nothing, never mind that you are nothing along with them, you don't think that way. And you fear and recoil from connectedness, like by doing harmful things with sexuality to create distance even in situations of closest intimacy. There you go, you're, not, you're just getting it for yourself and you don't care if you, you even, even might get off on hurting the other person in some way. And so, uh, doing harmful things with sexuality to create distance. So this is like having closed minded mentally and imposing your view and making, hey, look at me, I'm here, I'm the one that's all about me. And that kind of unrealistic self-centeredness and rigidity of my mind and ideological fanaticism or spiritual or religious fanaticism for that matter. And it make, I'm great because I believe this and this is the only way it is and blah, blah. Projecting even that there's a God behind you who's that way but likes you because you grovel to that being, uh, the authoritarian type of personality. And so that's like the one who has lousy sex, <laughs> harmful and nasty. So in other words, doing harmful things with sexuality in sexual context to create distance between you and the object, even your object, even in situations of closest intimacy. Realistic mind, on the other hand, embraces causation and connectivity. It not only skillfully reinforces all good qualities and responsible tendencies in you, habits and instincts, uh, tendencies, habits and instincts, uh, it's different levels of subtlety, of, uh, of uh, structured uh, interaction, but also enables you to move past fear and expand your connection to the world, realizing the benefit both to yourself and others, of opening your heart and mind and feeling one with others. And so this is like, this is the wonderful Tibetan and Indian thing called Maha Mudra, which, is, which in a way literally translates as, well, Mudra can mean a gesture and it can also mean a consort or partner, an intimate partner, it can mean Mudra, in the sense that the embrace with the partner is like a, is like a gesture and a, po a posture and a gesture, you know? But there is a Mahamudra means somehow, it's like you're making love with the whole universe. That is to say, you love everything in it and everyone, but everything as well. And you have like orgasmic sight and orgasmic hearing and orgasmic smelling and tasting as well as touching. And you feel the world reacting to you in a completely loving and wonderful way. And that's called Mahamudra, it's where that's Buddhahood as being in love with the universe and having the universe in love with you. And, uh, and you don't even have to go and bother everybody. <laughs> it's just the way, way you perceive everything. So that's wonderful, feeling one. So opening your heart and mind and feeling one with others, that's what it is. Realistic mind also leads you to discover that the absolute reality of nirvana and all Buddha's reality body is non-dual not separate from the world of causality. It thus enables you to enjoy an immutable, deathless bliss, virtually beyond causal interference or entanglement, without ceasing actually to engage with the causal world of other suffering beings. So in other words, you, it's a really impossible to, it's an inexpressibly 
cognitively dissonant embracing thing to think of enlightenment where you're completely in Mahamudra in the great embrace with all life, in love with it and it's in love with you. And yet you also can specifically discern and see simultaneously the difference between you and others and things and how to ameliorate them and how to connect to them so you're still responsible of yourself as what they perceive as a separate agent. And, and you, you're simultaneously a separate agent and yet you know exactly what you see from their perspective simultaneously. So you're both yourself and them and, and, and yourself. And this is the wonderful thing, like commun why I like the word communion <clears throat> for the highest state in Tantra, where you embody Mahamudra and you embrace the universe and you feel it embracing you, because you can also remain yourself. And yet you are, you are the other and yourself. And the ideal lo loving relationship is where both are more themselves, more magnificently and more happily and more blissfully than they could possibly be just by being selfish. So they're successfully selfish in the sense that they've reached the absolute, what they conceive of as relatively absolute, at least to their ordinary way of being, they're in their best possible state. At the same time, they're one with the other one. And they're, and they're, they're in that way by resonating with the other that way. So, and the Tibetan word is, the Sanskrit word is yuga nadha. So nadha means bound, and yuga means a pair, as, a, as, a, as a, one of a pair. So bound as one of a pair. And the Tibetan is sung juk. And sung is, you know, where you are holding yourself, and yet you're interpenetrating, so interpenetrating with another. You're interbeing with the universe. And Thich, Thich Nhat Hanh really was... He was a great, great teacher, he is a great, great teacher. He came up with this idea of interbeing, that we inter are, etc., which I really think is, this is that thing, it's inter is. So in other words, it is in its relationships, that means emphasizing that side. So the reality of this is inconceivable, exactly, and in a way inexpressible, and therefore stunning. It is why, why grace is amazing, of the amazing grace. You know, because of the amazing grace, for example, with, with the Savior, with the, in the Christian view, the, the, the good side of the Christian view, is where they're amazed that they feel a oneness that they assume Christ feels with them. And that is what the graciousness is, because they feel saved, redeemed, away from their frightened thing of feeling the universe is other than themselves, and therefore has dangers to them in it. And they feel this divine being is one with them when they have that kind of deep faith. And that's just like the Mahamudra, actually. It's kind of like a localized Mahamudra through the person of a savior. And it relates to Indian bhakti about Krishna, Indian bhakti about Tara, about, about Avalokiteshvara, Manjushri, Vajrapani, the Bodhisattvas, you know, the great Bodhisattvas, Kshiti Garba, Kasha Garba, Samantabhadra, and so on. And total, the Jesus thing totally relates to them because the idea is that Jesus, even through death, is in love with all beings, is the great, is the magnificent per, uh, omnipotence projected deity that absorbs you, sort of thing, where you then become safe and free and, and, uh, and uh, so on, although maybe you feel you're just a little piece of that deity. I mean, there's various degrees of it. But the great mystics, either Islamic, Christian, or Judaic, in, or Hindu, or Taoist in history, that we know, it's interesting, all those things, Eurasia, because we don't know the native people's real thing. In the, in the Native Americas or Sub-Saharan Africa, we, Eskimos and things, we don't really know. They're ancient, original things, which were kind of oneness with nature, we assume, but they may have also had, certainly also had deities and things, absolutely, and animals. And uh, uh, there are really, this is where, you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama helps everyone by saying that the task for the being for the spiritual being is to feel connected to the great oneness of all beings 
and also to give the benefit of the doubt to other cultures and ideologies that have lasted as not being harmful, as being helpful, not thinking that if someone approaches this sort of feeling of ultimate safety and security and blissfulness and happiness, that it not be excluding others because it's only through one's own Krishna, one's own Jesus, one's own Bodhisattva, one's own Lao Tzu or Zhuangzi or whatever it is. In other words, if one can feel that way through Jesus or through Krishna or through Avalokiteshvara or Lokeshvara, then you, feel, you, really, you say, well, the other one can get just to that sense themselves through the, whatever the form of it they imagine in their culture. I had a wonderful vision of that once when I happened to chance upon one of those fundamentalist preachers in the TV who was having the vast uh, audience in the stadium-like church uh, all stand up, standing up for Jesus. You know, they're really getting emotional and flipped out about it. And I realized that how awful if these poor folks could only do that when they were saying a seven-syllable word, Avalokiteshvara. <laughs> they were just going, Jesus, that's all. You know, Isa, actually, Jesus in Asia is known as Isa. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, that's it, two syllables. And Avalokiteshvara, how, how dreadful. Or Salvini Varana Viscambini. If you had to use that Bodhisattva name like that, it would be really awful. So let it be simple. You know, that's really great. So in, in the absolute reality, I'm going to read this as a deep paragraph. Realistic mind also leads you to discover that the absolute reality of nirvana and all Buddha's reality body, what we call, is non-dual. <coughs> not separate from the world of causality. It thus enables you to enjoy an immutable, deathless bliss, virtually beyond causal interference or entanglement. At the same time, it doesn't cease actually to engage with the causal world of other suffering beings. So you're doing it at the same time as you're not, it's not happening. So this makes it a kind of, it's like it's a virtual, all reality is virtual, and you're kind of playing with it, and it's more malleable, and you can always improve it, and you can always make it better for others, and you can be completely flexible and resilient. The reality of this is inconceivable, stunning, amazing grace, and goes beyond expressibility, except for paradoxical statements such as, in but not of the world, wisdom and compassion indivisible, bliss, freedom indivisible, bliss, voidness, indivisible, and so on. The great sayings of all world teachers reflect this level of enlightened interconnected consequentiality. Who lives by the sword dies by the sword. That's the ordinary saying. And even such, com that's the negative side, such common sayings as what goes around comes around. All these sayings indicate the common awareness that the way you behave affects your state of being. Ancient people in general, and many people still today, have recognized the reality of the present being affected by happenings in former lives, and so considered how what they do in the present will affect the quality of future lives. Just as we normally recognize the effect of prior actions in this life on the present, and are normally concerned with the effect of present actions on our future in this life. That's just common sense. And that's why, that, and actually that should always be a test of the higher science. When science gets all in a corner and they say, oh, your ordin ordinary perception is just completely wrong and it's all weird and it's a collapse of the wave function and the cat is dead and alive and it's not dead until you see it's dead and blah, blah. Just they're going crazy. It shows you that they're spinning their wheels. They're running away from inconceivability. They're not allowing reality to be itself and then observe it and realize it's always beyond whatever they can fully observed from all directions, at least in their ordinary single perspective dominated being. And therefore, and also therefore they can't rule out within an infinite context of infinite possibilities that there could be a being that would perceive things from every perspective simultaneously, which is what a Buddha would be defined as. And so they don't, uh, don't 
that so even though you can say, I can only see it from this perspective, if you're fully open-minded, you could be aware that maybe it's possible I can always include more and more and more and be able to perceive it from more and more perspectives at once. And they'll re realize that any, therefore, scientific presentation or obje observation temporarily adopting a certain perspective in a certain context to achieve a certain goal, to interact with a certain situation, that, that, and yet be open to other ones like that, uh, they, can, they can be open in that way and they don't need to be afraid of inexpressibility, realizing that even this experience of becoming a little bit more artistic and poetic, poetical themselves, and realize that re-eating an apple is an inconceivable action. You can never fully describe even the chemistry of it, the, the molecular molecules involved, the atoms, the subatomic particles, and the mental subjective, you know, the whole amazing activity of the mind, the subtle taste, the brain. The, it's just inconceivable, the, the act of eating an apple. And yet you can eat and enjoy an apple. You can't say it doesn't happen. It happens in a kind of miraculous manner. It's a gracious deed, and so on. The impact of the karmic evolutionary theory. Uh, maybe we, we can, uh, this will be enough for today. And uh, <clears throat> we will come back to the next section. The reason this karma is so important, and here I must let me end with a little bit of a complaint. It's in my own fault this book and also a lot of, you know, I just, I'm not very good in PR. I'm not very good at marketing. And the regular Buddhist, the karma, okay, that's a Buddhist theory. That has to be absolutely wrong and against modern ideas because it's some pre-modern thing. They ha even they are infected by that idea. Scientists won't take it seriously. The book by, a wonderful book by Thomas Nagel, a senior and very deep and profound philosopher who used to be at NYU or may still be, or is emeritus there. He critiqued the, the dogmatic materialism of biologists in his book, Mind and Cosmos. And he said, of course, he understands why they are dogmatically against mind, because they think if mind becomes an object of observation and concern and, con and conceptualization and theorization, it will just end up with religious dogmatism and the church will come back, God will get them, and, it'll, and the, it will leave things unexplained and, and uh, they'll be all burned at the stake you know, if they discover something new, like Giordano Bruno was, or they'll be, they'll be muzzled like Galileo or whatever, you know, by some fanatic inquisition. So they've, therefore they're scared of that. But he said there is a way, there must be a way. He doesn't know karma theory himself, I don't think, at least at the time he wrote that book. You know, I don't unfortunately know Thomas Nagel. I, I'd like to. But anyway, he says there must be a way of looking at mind in a pragmatic, commonsensical, and also scientific, highly sophisticated, looking at the great subtleties and so forth, you know, neuroscientifically even, uh, but yet being aware that there is a subjectivity and there is something that's, that, that may be incomprehensible from a pure materialist measurement point of view and yet is something that is causally effective in life. And therefore, it's a part of the study of life by O. Le G. And therefore, it should be dealt with. And actually, he's calling for them to get a load of the theory of karma. Itself not absolutely dogmatic, not rejecting everything, or saying that it's the one and only thing, but having a lot of interesting aspects that Darwin didn't get because of being in, into, uh, involved in English materialism, in sort of colonial Anglo-materialism. We can measure our empire. We can control things when we can control the matter around everything and everybody. We have all the resources and put it through our factories, and we can dominate the wealth of the world and so on, the colonial Nazi thing. And uh, so the scientists will not look at karma as a, scien as a, as a parallel collegial scientific theory and seek to put their analytic analytic powers into it and refine it and develop it and so forth. They won't take it seriously because it's pre-modern in their dogmas. And even the Buddhists will act like, oh yeah, it's just karma, it's just this, you know, Buddha's idea, but he didn't have a 
machinery didn't have electron microscopes and so forth. Meanwhile, the mind of the human being can be an electron microscope. You can develop a thing where you can see this, world, this room, every atom in it has another universe in that. You can experience being in that micro-universe. And in that micro-universe, you can experience every atom in that micro-universe. That is to say, every atom within a universe in an atom has a universe in it. And you can keep doing that into the micro-infinite. And your own mind can do that. In that sense, it can discover the infinite divisibility of matter, the inability, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that they found with machine observation. You can find it in mental yogic observation. And indeed, Buddhas did that. And they gave that teaching as scientists. So my complaint is this, this interconnectedness and new creativity within our modern sciences by meeting up with the inner sciences of India. This is my frustration, and in a way his holiness, but he's much more cool than me. He doesn't get wound up, and so he stays polite and happy, and never mind, they'll get there. He knows that, but I don't, so I get frustrated and impatient. But the point is, this is where I would complain. This chapter of evolutionary action, and even translating the word karma as evolutionary causation, is earth-shattering, actually, in our cultural hubris and provincialism that we're the most intelligent and the most scientific and the most powerful and the most this and most that. We could be the most destructive. We have been the most destructive yet, yet that we know of. Maybe there was Atlantis that destroyed himself completely and got buried under water. <laughs> maybe. But so as far as what we know and recorded, we are the most destructive, uh, certainly. But therefore, we, but we could avoid being the most destructive, we could be the most creative by connecting through time with people who've had cultures and people and scientists that have had better results than ours by being open-minded about it and seeing our own faults more carefully and clearly. And that's what I'm pushing for and that's what we're doing. And so I'm going to get into that in the last couple of pages of this chapter. It's a long chapter. This is now the second thing on this chapter the impact of the karmic evolutionary theory today. And I'm going to, I'm going to do that next time. And mean, then we're going to kind of, well, that's going to lead us into realistic livelihood, chapter six. Okay, so we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for attending on this. Thank you for participating. I had some new thought even by talking to you, so I'm grateful for that. And all the best. And Gewa di Nyodu Dang, just in Jamia and Club Dune, or Chicha Malabande, in Salagoba Show. So, by the virtue of this, may we quickly, all of us, become Manjushris, Buddhas, in order to be able to, as quickly as possible, or at the same time even, bring all beings into that. How would we do it at the same time? Well, we'd have to, the future, every moment of the poss all the possible futures, would have to be immediate to us when we become immediately aware of everything as a Buddha. <laughs> and that's inexpressible, indeed, and inconceivable. I agree. Doesn't mean it's not attainable, actually, given the infinite context in which we live and the timeless infinite context in which life actually flourishes. So all the best. That's our dedication. Every single one of you, find your own enlightenment within. It's in you already. It's not something anybody else can either put there or deny putting there. You have it. You have to turn inward to find it. Please do so with alacrity. Thank you very much. All the best.